Condensed structures, that will be the topic of this lesson, and uh, we're getting into a chapter on molecular representations and resonance, and we're going to learn how to draw organic molecules. In addition to Lewis structures, uh, we've got what I call condensed structures, and then we've also got bond line structures, the topic of the next lesson. Uh, after that, we'll talk about what are called functional groups, some different uh, chemical moieties, we call them, uh, that you know, kind of underlie some different chemical reactivities of molecules, and then finally we'll top this off with a lesson on resonance. Now, this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I put one of these up. All right, condensed structures. So I've got an example on the board here. And again, this is organic chemistry. and It's all about carbon. And you'll find out that uh, a carbon chain is kind of the backbone of most molecules. And in a condensed structure, we list a carbon and immediately following it, we list how many hydrogens are attached to it is typically how it works. And so in this case, this first carbon is bonded to these three hydrogens. And if we turn this into a Lewis structure, we'd have a carbon bonded to three hydrogens. And then that carbon is bonded to the next carbon in the condensed structure. So we'll draw that carbon in and he's bonded to two hydrogens. So, and then he's bonded to the next carbon in the chain. And notice that our carbons are going to typically end up with four bonds. It's typically the way it works for a neutral carbon atom. And this carbon now has also bonded to two hydrogens. And then he's bonded to the next carbon in the chain, which is also bonded to two hydrogens. And finally, that's bonded to the next carbon in the chain, bonded to three hydrogens. Cool. And that is converting our cadet structure into a Lewis structure. And one of the things you'll kind of get in the idea is, is uh, just a reminder on how many bonds different atoms are supposed to have. And the halogens typically make one bond, just like hydrogen. So just wanting one more electron to get a filled shell, if you will. Uh, oxygen's column wants two bonds, nitrogen column three bonds, and carbon's column typically four bonds uh, is what we're usually shooting for. And again, this assumes no formal charge. If we got formal charges, those number of bonds will change just a little bit. And we'll see examples of that in this lesson. All right, so this is a really simplistic uh, condensed structure, and they get a little more complicated than this. And you'll find out that uh, in the next two lessons that organic chemists, we're just lazy people in general. And the truth is we're just really being efficient, but I like to say lazy. So, and in this case, we're usually going to try and draw as little as possible. And so one of the big major tools we use in condensed structures are parentheses. Now, unfortunately, we're going to use parentheses in three different ways, which is rather annoying. And it's not always spelled out explicitly that there are three different reasons to use parentheses. We often just start using them and expect you to catch, you know, catch along at some point in time. So we're going to go through those three exact reasons of why we might use parentheses. And the first one is when you've got a long carbon chain, just like we do here, and you have these repeating CH2 groups. We call these methylene groups. There's repeating CH2 groups. And rather than write a condensed structure like this, which is totally acceptable, nothing wrong with this, but we can make it shorter. And so in this case, we can turn this into, we'll still start with CH3 right at the end here, but instead of writing all three of these CH2 outs, we'll write CH2, put it in parentheses, and show that there are three of them repeating. And we only use this repeating pattern for CH2 groups, again, called methylene groups. And then we'll get right to the end, CH3. So that's the first case we're going to use parentheses. So, but there are two additional cases. So, but again, the only time we're going to use this as a repeating parentheses here, so for a repeating pattern is for CH2s, not for anything else. So that's the first way we're going to use parentheses. Let's take a look at the next two. Okay, so the second place we'll use parentheses is when you've got a long carbon chain and you've got branches coming off the main chain. Now, it turns out that branches coming off that main carbon chain aren't always going to need parentheses. If those branches are a single atom like a halogen, well, then you don't need parentheses. You don't use parentheses. But if they are multi-atoms, if there's many atoms in that branch, that's when you're going to need to use parentheses. And that's what's going on right here with this CH3 in parentheses. This entire CH3 is a branch coming off the main chain. So let's turn this condensed structure once again into a Lewis structure. So we've got a carbon bonded to three hydrons. We'll start there. So bonded to the next carbon in the chain. And this carbon right here is bonded not only to a hydrogen, but he's bonded to a bromine. Don't forget that halogens typically form just one bond. And in this case, because it's just a single atom, they don't put it in parentheses. It's implied that being a bromine, so it can only make one bond, it could never go in the middle of the chain because anything in the middle of the chain is going to have to be able to make multiple bonds. Cool. And then we'll move on to the next carbon. And that next carbon is bonded to just a single hydrogen. Cool. And then it's bonded to the CH3. 
as a branch coming off the main chain. And again, because it has four atoms, not just one, that's why it's showing up in parentheses in this example uh, in our condensed structure. And then we'll move on to the next carbon in the chain. I'll just draw a long bond so I can keep lining this up. So bonded to two hydrogens and then to the next carbon in the chain, bonded to three hydrogens. Cool, so this is the second place we use parentheses. So again, the first place was repeating CH2 groups. The second place here is multi-atom branches coming off the main chain. All right, this last example where we use parentheses is really just an expansion or a special case of the second way we used them, and, and that was for branches. And in this case, we'll use it for branches, but in this case, when you see a little subscript here, it means you have multiple of those branches that are identical coming off whatever carbon they're attached to. And so in this case, notice we only need to use these for, again, multi-atom branches. So same thing in, in the second rule. We're only going to use parentheses around branches that have multi-atoms. And now we see that we can actually show that there are multiple identical branches attached to the same carbon using parentheses in this fashion. So in this case, we've got this carbon right here. And that carbon right there is bonded to one hydrogen, but he's also bonded to two of these CH3. So we've got one here and one here. And I really could have drawn these in any, any pattern. It's all the same thing. Cool, and then this carbon's bonded over to the next carbon, which is bonded to two H's, which is bonded to the last CH3 here. Cool, and that is our Lewis structure matching up with this condensed structure. All right, next part of condensed structure we wanna focus on is when we've gotta add pi bonds into the structure. And the idea is that, you know, if you set up your skeleton as depicted by your condensed structure, uh, if, you know, not every atom's got a filled octet, if you've got two adjacent atoms that both need more electrons, you'll typically give them at least one pi bond, like a double bond or potentially even two pi bonds uh, and like a triple bond between them uh, as, as the case may deem. So let's take a look at this here. So this first example, again, we've start off with a carbon bonded to three hydrogens. Cool. Bonded to the next carbon in the chain, which is bonded to two hydrogens. Which is bonded to the next carbon in the chain, which is bonded to one hydrogen. Which is bonded to the next carbon in the chain, which is bonded to one hydrogen. Which is bonded to the next carbon in the chain, which is bonded to three hydrogens. And if we go back and examine this structure, we'll notice that this carbon right here has only got three bonds. This carbon right here has only got three bonds, and they don't have any charge on them. And so typically carbon, again, with no charge, got four bonds. Well, two adjacent atoms, both short one bond. The easy solution is to then put a double bond between them. Cool. And it just, we had two atoms adjacent to each other that both needed one more bond. Quick solution is to put a pi bond there. So similar fashion right here. So start off again with a carbon bond of three H's, bonded to the next carbon in the chain, bonded to two H's. So next two carbons in the chain, bonded finally to the last carbon, bonded to three H's. And then similar to the last example, we now got here two carbons right next to each other that both only have two bonds. Again, there's no formal charges showed on them, so they really should get four bonds. And so the quick solution to get them both two more bonds is to have them share two more bonds, in this case, two pi bonds. And there we've got a triple bond. So this is kind of how you deduce that you've got either a double or a triple bond in one of these condensed structures. You just got atoms next to each other that both don't have a filled octet. All right, we'll find that oxygen's a common atom in a lot of organic molecules. And when you've got a condensed structure with oxygen in it, as you do here, so what you'll find is that if you try and, uh, oxygen can make two bonds, first of all, and that's pretty typical of oxygen. Technically, oxygen can make three if he's got a positive formal charge, but neutral oxygen typically makes two bonds. And when oxygen makes two bonds, that means he actually can go in the middle of the chain of atoms. So key again is that if you only make one bond, you can't go in the middle of the chain because you've got to make at least two to branch in two directions to go in the middle of the chain. And oxygen can totally do that. So the question is, how can you tell if oxygen's in the middle of the chain or if oxygen is a branch coming off the chain? And it's tricky because oxygen is just a single atom. So we don't have to put him in parentheses or anything like that if he's a branch. And so a condensed structure is not going to just come out and tell you if the oxygen goes in the middle of the chain or is a branch off the chain. And so usually I say default, try him in the middle of the chain. But if you see a bunch of atoms that are not getting their filled octets, you might realize he's gonna end up being a branch instead. So let's take a look at the first one here. So we've got a carbon bonded to three hydrogens, bonded to another carbon with just one hydrogen, bonded to another carbon with just one hydrogen, bonded to a carbon, bonded to an oxygen, bonded to a carbon with three hydrogens. 
So if we start looking at this here, so we've got some problems here. These, this carbon right here has only got three bonds. This one's only got three bonds. This one's only got two. So we might be like, well, we've seen this pattern before. Let's just put a double bond in here. And these two are now happy. But the problem is we're never going to get that carbon happy. He needs two more bonds, but the atoms next to him now don't need any more bonds. So this is usually kind of where, where you get to a point where you deduce, oh, that oxygen probably wasn't supposed to go in the middle of the chain, but be a branch coming off the chain. And that's what we're going to do here. So I'm going to erase this right here. We're now going to make that oxygen a branch coming off the chain and then connect this carbon to the next one in the chain right over here. Cool. And so now if we go back and examine this one more time, so we see that we've got that carbon, which only has three bonds, needs one more. And we've got the oxygen right next to it, which only has one bond and needs one more. And so once again, just like we had over here, we've got two adjacent atoms that both need one more bond. And the easy solution is to put a double bond in right there. Cool. And this is an example of one of the functional groups we'll study later in this chapter called a ketone. All right, so let's take a look at this one as well. So it'll work out pretty similar to the one we just did. So start this off, carbon bonded to three hydrants, bonded to the next carbon, which is bonded to two hydrants, bonded to the next carbon, which is also bonded to two hydrants, bonded to the next carbon, which is bonded to an oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. So oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. And again, sometimes though, oxygens are in the chain and sometimes they're a branch coming off the chain. So, but if we take a look here, so these three carbons are all happy. They got four bonds each, but this one's only got two. And then we got these oxygens here that both already have two bonds, which is their normal number. So the only atom that's not happy is that carbon. He needs two more bonds and there's nobody next to him who needs any more bonds. So we can't just throw pi bonds in there. And so in this case, again, that's evidence that we probably should take one of those auctions off and make it a branch and then bond the carbon to the last auction there. And by doing it this way, similar to what we did in this last example, we end up with two atoms, carbon in this case with three bonds needs one more, auction with only one bond needs one more, but two atoms next to each other, both needing one more bond and the easy fix is to put a little bond here. And we'll find out that this is an example of a carboxylic acid. I believe we did one of these examples back in chapter one as well. And I said, hey, we'll talk about these later in chapter two. Well, we're talking about them now, but we'll talk about them again in the third lesson in this chapter as well.